Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's. Proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I'm Evan Irwin and we get started each top 10 by saying hi to my two co-hosts, Ruben Pressler. How you doing buddy? Aaron Campbell. Is it time? <gasps> is it? Is it time? <laughs> Oh my God! That's that's where we're starting, right? There's the line. We just we just the drew low it in the sand. Fruit. Oh, yeah. we tripped over it. Um, it was it was pretty low, but we also begin with our choice of the top comment from well two weeks ago, and a yeah. segment we call honorable mention, where Ruin will tell us who was the most prolific and letting us know what card we didn't choose as one of our top ten overhyped cards. Ruben. Well, there are two weeks worth of comments to go through, and the one that I ended up going with was from Clave D, who writes, There is one card that, at least for me, deserves a place in this list, at least in the sense of pre-order hype and post-launch performance. The fact that you guys forget about this when you said the most hype cards of Born of the Gods is the final nail on the argument. Brumads, King of Arescos, got the full treatment. Evan was overhyped for this in the Magic Show. It got a price of $25 and for a long time was called, quote, the only reason to open a Born of the Gods booster pack. <laughs> and then just didn't. We discovered that the three-mana creature of the edition was the Corsair of Crufix, and Brumaz never saw any decent play. Yeah, now you can see it in some taxes list, but the king was never really living up to his title. He never did. That was yeah. really sad. I mean, because I remember. I mean, look look at all the things that that card did. It was a three minute three four. Like that's where you start, and it's making guys yeah. coming and going. Like the things seems insane. Yeah, I mean, it's a three four with no drawback for three mana and two insane abilities. Uh, unfortunately, it lived in a format where having three power was not that big of a deal. Um, it, it was a color that was, like there was no real good mono white lists outside of the heroic kind of stuff. It just uh, just didn't do it. Well, it also had to compete with, it started to creep into into uh, Konzatar. You were dealing with Anathenza, the first Anathenza, which you could also do for three. You know, you were running into Siege Rhino, so there's no way it was going to get past the Siege Rhino. So this was one of those cards that, sometimes we see this where cards get made or broken depending on what comes after that set. Sure. And what came after with Cons was just, it just didn't hold a candle to it. Yeah, it was uh, it was one of those things where like Born of the Gods was already bad, but at least it had Corsair and Brimaz, and then it didn't have one of those, right. and then it was really yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. unfortunate. But Clave, congratulations on winning a fifty dollars gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. Please yeah. give us a contact on any of our awesome social channels. Twitter's the best. Hit us up. You know, tell us who you is. I will give yeah. you your gift certificate. It'll be great, and you can spend you, it on mind sculptors because it's they're illegal right. now. There you go. <laughs> if, you show up, if you show up to Cool Stuff in Florida and you have the name Clave on your driver's license, probably any Clave can just claim that prize because there's only like six of you. So, <laughs> Seven billion people, X Claves. Let's see yep. what that number is. Uh, that said, uh, we're going to go here to our top ten is it cards. This, this finishes every single guild. Oof. Yeah. This is the last one. For our one. top tens. This is the tenth <clears throat> of the ten guilds. Arguably the most beloved color combination, maybe not the most beloved guild, but Red Blue has a long storied history of competitive magic play all the way back from Counterburn way back in the day, through Twin, through the most recent blue red kind of Pyromancer decks. Um, you know, there's there's a, a, a lot of decks with the blue red color combination. Yeah, it's, it's going to get a little crazy here. There's only so many cards, there's a little bit of overlap. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, we all have three hires and a same. Yeah. Uh, that yes, right? that is correct. Yes. <laughs> all right. Oh my God, we're all on the same cycle. On that cycle, y'all. They aren't. They aren't all the same hires and no, the same. Like, same. We've, all sort of we've we've teeter tottered through um, through all of these with like two hires and a same, and you've got four and a one, and like we all right. have three hires. This is awesome. That's right. I have three hires and two sames. To be fair. Oh, okay. Oh, I have three okay. hires and one same. Damn it, Ruben. Oops. Well, I broke it. I broke it up. I, <laughs> I wanted to share with both of you. That's well, okay. let's go ahead and get started, Ruben, with your number 10. How much do y'all know about Celtic mythology? Mm, I'd say I'm a neophyte. Are you a big fan of Celtic mythology? Well, Magic the Gathering has a strange history with Celtic mythology. Sometimes they directly name cards 
after things in Kel Celtic mythology, such as Kelpies, the River Kelpie, for example, being one of them. Sometimes they changed the name. The Dullahan uh, is the Headless Horseman, right? That's oh. that's uh, they, they changed the name away from the Dullahan. One that I'm surprised they didn't change the name of, that they actually kept, was imagine a horseman on his steed, uh, but no skin whatsoever, and the horseman is attached to the steed. It's one animal. What? This is a, this is a description of Orkney mythology called the Nuklevi, and the mm. Nuklevi is a card that doesn't really dis match that same description too well, um, because the Nuklevi also sh sh shifts, shifts and changes shape in the ocean. And while no one has seen what a Nuklevi looks like in the ocean, we do get a small depiction of it illustrated by Trevor Hairseen on the card Nuklevi, which is a roundabout way of telling you that that's my number 10. It's a four colorless, is it, is it, six mana creature, so either blue red and or blue red. It's a beast. And when Nuklevi comes into play, or enters the battlefield at this point, you may return target red sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. And when it comes into play, you may return target blue instant card from your graveyard to the hand. And it's a 4-4 four, four for 6. This card was uh, a ton of fun. I always loved having this card in draft because you were able to return uh, a counter spell and a removal spell. You know, um, burn trail was a, was a, was a popular thing uh, at the time to get back with this in limited. It saw some play in the quick and toast strategies as a one-of to be able to return... Um, Whatever X spell du jour was popular, as well as a copy of Cryptic Command. Yeah. Um, you could loop, loop Nuklevi and Crypt, uh, Cryptic Command to be able to rebuy um, a, a red sorcery spell for free. Uh, it cost you a ton of mana to do so, but you were able to do it in that format. Uh, Nuklevi is just all about value. It's a, it's, it's an is it Cronarch? Mm -hmm. It's an Archivist. It's a uh, Scrivener, all stapled together onto a four four, and it's a ton of fun for a card. It's it's a really sweet one from Eventide. I, I don't really think it, it it's just it doesn't have quite the right numbers on it to see a sure. ton of constructed play, but it's got just enough to where Quick and Toast had like a million mana and didn't really matter what the mana costs were because everything was a right. reflecting pool or whatever. Um, but but Nuklevi itself is cool and weird and freaky looking. That's a it's, it's that. cool and weird and freaky looking. And also keep in mind it could return cruel ultimatums in that Quick and Toast deck. Ooh, that's delicious. But yeah. Aaron, what is your number ten? My number 10 is higher on somebody else's list. I'm, I'm filling the Ruben role tonight of starting off strong. Just, yeah, there you go. Wow. You know. All right. I'm always torn whether I want to have my hires early on a list or later on a list. I'm not sure which one I like better. Well, what I found was when I was making this list, it was, it was cool because I was like, hmm, I can... I, you know, there was some that really drifted directly towards the top for me, but there was others when you definitely got down to eight, nine, ten ish or so, I could kind of have some fun. I could be like, yeah. you know what? I like these cards because I think they're super sweet. And yeah. <laughs> this one is just a good old fashioned super sweet card. Now, this is also from Eventide because Eventide was about enemy colors and hybrid mana and that stuff. And, it was <clears> cool. <throat> um, and this card, it, it was also in, insane and not quite insane limited because you wanted it to be good, but it was it was good, really good and sealed. Um, but but there's certain things that red and blue do, and often that times is making stuff and making tokens. And whenever you want to go really big, and you want to pay seven mana, and not only do you want to pay seven mana, but you can also rebuy it with retrace. Mm -hmm. Call the Skybreaker. You're Oof. calling in the big dogs, the biggie big dogs. It's a five. Is it? Is it? So total of seven mana. Uh, for a rare sorcery from Eventide that says uh, put a 5-5 blue and red elemental creature token with flying onto the battlefield and has retrace that says you may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. So once you made a 7-7, every land for the rest of the game was a 5-5 flyer. And that was super sweet. Limited was a little bit too fast to really make this thing an all-star, but of course, you know, when you're in sealed and everything's slower, it's cool. But this one, I, just, I thought it was neat. I love the picture. I like the idea of it. I thought the, the making big tokens every turn super fun, and it's a blue red card, so it just you know, checked all the boxes. That's yeah, okay. absolutely. I, I really like Call the Skybreaker. It's a cool one. It also allows you to print those five five elementals uh, whenever you reprint or retrace it in f uh, future sets. Yeah, so that's super fun. We're going to move on here to number nine. Aaron, do you got one? 
I do, actually. So my number nine is a card uh, based on a character that we saw a lot of in the flavor text, uh, specifically when it comes to Innistrad Block. And I love this character. This character had a very kind of dark sense of humor. Uh, they are known for being a bit of a scientist. Um, and I just love the way that they sort of took a spin on the, you know, we've certainly seen the Is It League from Return to Ravnica and sort of their kind of punny nature, the way that they joke about themselves and, and the way that they're talked about. But this was a little bit darker and I really, really enjoyed it. And I was really happy to see this this character get their own card um, because sometimes when they give characters from flavor text and from the story a card, it doesn't really live up to the hype. But this one certainly did. Uh, my number nine is Ludovic Necro Alchemist. <laughs> Ludovic, yes! Wow. Um, so Ludovic is one red and a blue. He's a 1-4 legendary creature human wizard. At the beginning of each player's end step, that player may draw a card if a player other than you lost life this turn. Uh, and then his partner. It was from the Commander 2016 set. Uh, and the, also, Ludovic's Opus was a card, so you could pair him with his Opus. That was awesome. But the flavor text is, is what brings it home for me. How does one become a self-taught genius? Naturally, it requires brains. <laughs> wow. I love it! I love it! I get it. it. I get it. Yeah, it's, it's very kind of unlike is it in a way, just to sort of be that kind of macabre. And I love this character. I love the art. Um, you know, you see he's putting some poor <clears throat> poor guy through the ropes and doing these things. And um, I really like this. This card, I remember actually being quite good uh, in 1v1, I believe. Um, and so it's just really great. Lives up to the hype. And I uh, love everything about it. It's a super cool card for just three men. I mean, Ludovic's test subject was a rare in Innistrad. Right, uh, that, that hinted about this character. Yeah, it was yeah. a two-mana 3 defender that you put hatchling counters on and eventually becomes a 13 Prized Amalgam, I believe, also. Uh, is it, it is a Ludovic be, card? Is a Ludovic... Uh, might be. Flavor text, right. I think it was. Flavor sure, text, but... right. But this is the one like it's actually in the name of the card. Okay, yeah. Um, and I only found that because I was searching for Ludovic. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's a thing. Uh, yeah. But, you know, Ludovic himself, though, uh, that's a super cool ability. I liked Partner. I think Partner was interesting. I don't really think they're going to bring it back, though. No, it's way too good. Partner is un Because when you're playing Magic, you start with seven cards in your hand. When you're playing Commander, you essentially start with eight cards in your hand, right? Right. When you're playing with Partner, you're starting with nine cards in your hand. So it's just way too good. It puts you up on card advantage without doing anything other than building your deck. Yeah. So uh, I think I, that the ability is too good. I do want to clarify. Uh, Prize to flavor text actually mentions Ludovic's laboratory. The quote itself is from Giralf. Um, but Because uh, I know you two will get me for that one. Um, but one thing I also really like about Ludovic is it almost encourages you to be aggressive. Where, like I said, if you if someone yeah. other than you lost life, um, and from what I've seen, at least when I was going through Gatherer the other night, it's not too, like, there's some burn spells in Is It, but um, I feel like this in a multiplayer game really encourages everybody to kind of go after each other, yes. um, which I think is also kind of unusual for Is It. So I really like that uh that that tiny aspect of the card nice ruben what's your number nine my number nine you guys know that i like pro tour pedigree and my number nine had 16 copies of itself in the top eight of the set in which the pro tour it was named after was in this was pro tour uh theros i believe and i'm sorry this was not the not the not the pro tour that it came out in but a, a pro tour in which a set came out this was pro tour theros and pro tour theros had a lot of devotion lists it had three mono blue and one mono red devotion in the top eight and between those four decks there were 16 copies of frostburn weird yeah mm -hmm. Wow, this, this a, one. This is a blue two two copies of a blue red hybrid mana, so two mana mm -hmm. for a one four common weird from Re uh, Return to Ravnica, and then you can pay an is it mana either a red or a blue to give it plus one minus one until the end of the turn. In stark contrast to Brimaz, which we discussed as being an excellent card born into the wrong time, Frostburn Weird is a okay card. It's fine born into the perfect time. Both decks of Mono Red and Mono Blue Devotion needed a reasonable two drop to be able to grow their devotion and also hold off opposing strategies. Frostborn Weird having the Horned Turtle stats of being a 1-4 for only two mana, uh, in addition to being able to get in there for extra damage and also perhaps trade with a Night Veil Spectre or an opposing 1-4 uh, uh, on the other side of the board was, was very, very good. Frostborn Weird was a staple of both of those strategies. Being an is it card that's most well known for mono color strategies is a little bit interesting, <laughs> um, but that's what you get sometimes with cards from Return to Ravnica. Frostburn Weird was an excellent role player and uh, I think deserving of a spot in our top tens. 
it was it was one of those cards that just had all the right numbers. Like you yeah. needed uh-huh. you needed you know needed mana cost. Well, it's it's two of that or two of the other. It's exactly what you want. So you can stop the early game. It's early game. It's good. Late game. It's good. Um, and yeah, it just it, it turned into a much much better card than I think anyone gave it any credit for when it absolutely up. four toughness for two mana is a huge number, particularly as you can turn it into a threat later in the game. Right. Yeah, which is terrific, but. For my number nine, it's kind of my last, I don't know if I'd call it a silly pick, but, you know, it's sort of like my personal I like these cards because I like these cards pick. Um, and this one is really cool for me because it showed up in the first set where Is It was a thing, right? You know, like, mm-hmm. Is It is named in Guild Pack. This is, this is Is It, we're going to show you what it does, we're going to show you how it works, it's going to be really cool, this is what they do. And it was so cool and it's so interesting that back in the day, you didn't get a pre-release pack with a random rare in it or whatever. No, 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 they told you the rare. They made alternative art and they made it foil and you got a Gen Illuminatus. Gen mm-hmm. Illuminatus is super cool. Crazy as that card. This is one of those cards you're just like, what is happening? Yeah, what's happening? And that's great because they're introducing Is It. And so Gen Illuminatus is a seven mana, five generic and two Is It mana for a three, five flyer. It's a rare Gen, originally from Guild Pack. And each instant and sorcery that you play has replicate. The replicate cost is equal to its mana cost. When you play it, you copy it for each time you paid its replicate cost. You may choose new targets for the copy. So if you want to keep sort of just you know, pouring your mana into your spells, you know, you want to you know pay a bunch of light, you know, lightning bolts or whatever for five red mana, go nuts. Yep. Because you can replicate it all you want. And that's yep. super sweet. And again, this was this was your introduction to Is It was Gen Illuminatus. Yeah. The super weird stuff that is it can do the the mad scientist the weird kind of, uh, yeah weird exactly hashtag on um, brand <laughs> there was there was a corner case combo deck that this ran with uh, ancestral vision where you uh, replicated ancestral vision an infinite number of times to deck your opponent wow. um, which I thought was adorable um, yeah Jin Illuminatus is a super cool card and it exemplifies the chaotic weirdo nature of is it for sure. That's terrific. Well, I'm going to take a, uh, a little back seat here for a minute because my number eight and number seven are higher on someone else's list. Oof. So, Ruben, do you have a number eight? I do. Uh, this card has one of the um, the guild keywords attached to it. It's the uh, the return to Ravnica guild keyword of overload. This card saw a little bit of competitive play, but the reason why it's on my list in particular is because of how much it exemplifies uh, what you want to be doing as an is it mage. So my number eight is counterflux. So my my number eight is uh, uh, blue blue red instant rare from Return to Ravnica. Counterflux can't be countered by spells or abilities. Counter target spell you don't control, and it has overload of a colorless, a blue, a blue, and a red, which means that you can cast it for its overload cost, which means that you pay it for four instead of for three in this case. And if you do, you change its text by replacing all instances of target with each. Um, overload was the return to Ravnica keyword and for, for, for is it, and it's a weird one for sure. You had to template cards super strangely. Like you go back and read cards like street spasm and you're like, what's happening in this card or vandal blast is another good one. <laughs> like the wording just has to be super weird because of what the card does and counterflux, you know, counter target spell you don't control. Like that's kind of a weird sentence without the, uh, the, the overload on the bottom. This card was very important in those Jeskai control mirrors way back in the day with Sphinx's Revelation and whatnot, where your opponent would tap out for Sphinx's Revelation, you'd negate it, they'd negate you back, and then you'd counterflux both spells. Um, this was a, a, a big piece of, of what to do after sideboard in those kind of mirror matches. It's a little slow most of the time, uh, being a three uh, casting cost counter spell. But usually was good enough to warrant usually one main deck, one sideboard kind of uh, dealy back in the day when when those matchups were particularly relevant. Yeah, yeah. This was my number. Oh, sorry. Go for it. I was gonna say this is my number ten. Um, so this was my first hire, and I remember the first time I saw this card, I had never seen Mind Break Trap before. I didn't know that counter spells could do this, and so I remember the first time I had seen this, I was like, "What does this mean?" Like I was so confused. And nowadays we have things like Fluster Storm, and so it's it's not as as exciting as it used to be. But you know, back in the day, there weren't many examples of being able to do this. And um, yeah, this card just completely blew me away. I never saw anything like it. I run one in pretty much if I'm if I'm running any Is It colors in Commander, 
I at least make sure to have a counterflux in there um, because it does come in handy quite a bit uh, in, in quite a few ways. And uh, yeah, the art is fantastic. I seem to recall uh, somebody on Twitter. I think it might have been my friend Sonia, but someone did an amazing cosplay of this. I believe it was covered on either Legitim TG or Gathering Magic, but I remember just an amazing cosplay happening. And uh, yeah, oh, I really liked Overload too. Uh, I just want to talk about that as a mechanic. You know, the ability to uh, be flexible, where sometimes you just need to do one thing, and then sometimes you're in the late game where things are going really, really poorly, and you need to do lots of things. And I, I really hope. I, I don't know what the official stance on it is, but I would love to see Overload come back in some sort of Ravnica capacity. Yeah, it allows for sort of like a split card at ish. Uh, yeah. Kind of deal. Um, and Mizium Mortars, Cyclonic Rift, Vandal Blast, all Electricery. Oh, Electricery, of course. <laughs> also seeing some play. Yeah, it's a really it's a really solid ability with just enough of a competitive edge. Yeah. It, it was not the it, it was not the storm killer. I mean, one of the things I think a lot of people went to was like, oh, you can you know, you can counter every copy. That's like right. every copy of tendrils. Well, you're not going to have four mana. You're not going to have four right. mana hanging out in Legacy when it's time to stop the tendrils player from going off. But Overload and overload by itself as a mechanic, I absolutely love because again, it does it. It's Sperry, is it right? Like, let's yeah. just turn the volume all the way up and break <laughs> the knob on the way out and just blow everybody away. That yeah. is overload, and that's sweet. So, moving on here, Aaron, what is your number eight? <laughs> We're getting into the broken stuff. I can't. I was just gonna say, it's, it, this is a card that is broken in half. If we're laughing before we even get to the first sentence. So my new favorite thing in in Commander specifically is accidentally killing people. <laughs> Oops, you're dead. Right. So so the fun story. So I had seen. I'd wanted to build a deck around this Commander, and I decided to try it out on stream one night. And I had played with a couple of friends, and we were streaming. And I'll never forget. I had I had done something. What I perceived to be something very innocent and so I cast a spell and before I knew it things were happening and chat started blowing up and I went to look at chat and before I knew it I look back and two squares are gone <laughs> and I'm like where'd everybody go and they were like um you killed us <laughs> and after that moment I knew that this deck was a hit and that I needed this commander in my life uh, my number eight is the locust god <laughs> Nice. Um, turns out when you cast uh, when you cast uh, Molten Psyche with Impact Tremors and then uh, with Metalcraft and make a bunch of Locusts, things just die. It's glorious. Yeah. Um, so the Locust God <laughs> so fast. Wow. Um, so the Locust God is four blue and red. It's a four four legendary creature god uh, flying. Whenever you draw a card, create a one one blue and red insect creature token with flying and haste. And haste is very relevant. Um, you can pay two, a blue and a red, to just draw a card and then discard a card. And then it has sort of the Amonkhet Hour of Devastation, more Hour of Devastation, that God Clause of whenever it dies, you return it to an owner's hand uh, at the beginning of the next end step. So when you're playing Commander, you can choose to send it to your graveyard, um, which will, you know, you could you have a way to get it back or things like that. And so you're very rarely ever paying you're very rarely ever paying more than six because you put it in your graveyard, it comes back to your hand and everything's great. Um, but this card, this is busted. You do things like Wheel of Fortune, um, Shattered Perceptions. You can even just do Faithless Looting. You throw in a Coat of Arms, so all of your Locusts get really, really big. Um, it's just dumb. Windfall, Time Reversal, Days Undoing. I mean, I have had so much fun. Like, I've never identified as a Blue Mage. I don't know anything about that life. I don't know how to brainstorm. I don't know how to ponder. But damn it, this card has made me a believer. <laughs> And I I now love drawing cards because of this commander right here. <laughs> I mean, whereas the the scorpion god didn't get there, uh, the scarab god certainly did, and the locust god feels like sort of the commander version. Yeah, uh, the scorpion god is just kind of a weirdo. It has stuff. seen play. There are some legacy <clears throat> show and tell lists that have used the locust god as like a one of. Um, I remember some people in vintage have tried to run with it. Occasionally, sees like a one of, so nothing sure. crazy. But okay. yeah, it's been it's been touched in older formats, especially where you are drawing lots of cards and. It's not hard to get to six mana when you're you know you're playing cheaty face and but damn it it's so fun. I still have a higher for number seven, but Ruben, do you have a number seven? I don't. Mine is higher on someone else's list as well. Sadness. Aaron, can can you save us here? Can we have a number seven? All righty then. We're gonna move on here to number six. <laughs> it's gonna be sweet because I can actually talk about mine. I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make it happen. Okay. Now. I'm pretty sure one of these has been on every single list that we've done of the guilds. Maybe not, maybe. But, you know, we, we kind of have, we have a pattern. And mm -hmm. one of those patterns is usually looking at the cards that very much define what the guild does. Often it sometimes has it in the name, like charms do. 
because mm. you want to do a lot of things and is it charm does a lot of really cool things when we got back to Ravnica they're like okay cool you're gonna get a new weird like you know uh, uh, guild person was it was the um, guild mages or whatever uh, but we're gonna give you a card that does like eight different things and you're gonna love it and we're like oh, okay uh, is it charm is amazing because it's a red and a blue good old-fashioned red blue instant uncommon you choose one you counter target non-creature spell unless they pay two generic mana or it deals two damage target creature or you draw two cards and then discard two cards it's just it's it's good early it's good late it it's removal it's filtering it, it's is it it's just it's so good it's just a good old-fashioned does things magic card and it does all the things that that's yeah. what i like about it yeah, I absolutely. my first taste of this card was in Grishel Brand. Uh, there were blue versions that were running uh, blue versions of the deck that were running this, and it makes a very good discard outlet. It also makes a way to counter uh, opposing strategies, or it makes or it's a really nice way of killing hate bears or things that would get in your way. Uh, yeah, card's incredibly versatile. Yeah, it's also still in both the Vintage and the Legacy Cube. Um, yep. High pick in both 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 times. The the charms from the Return to Ravnica expansions in particular were really good at being niche role players that served many different types of roles. A lot of the older charms had one mode that you'd use 90% of the time, and then the other two modes were, you know, sort of medium to, to not useful at all. Um, for Is It Charm, you used all three modes consistently one third of the time. Um, and so Is It Charm in particular is the definition of a role player. It is the buffalo and all the parts yes. were used. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> which was nice. Ruben, what's your number six? Higher on somebody oh, else's list. Ruben. Up top. <laughs> way, way up top. Aaron, what's your number six? My number six is more of a sideboard card. Uh, it tends to see play against strategies that run little creatures. Uh, I remember the first time I had this card used against me, I misunderstood what it did. And when I realized how it worked, I realized it was even more powerful than I imagined it to be. I've had this brought in against me because they love to ping my Narc Amoebas. It's very good for killing Lingering Souls tokens. And it has a, a little bit of a booty on it, so it's a little difficult to kill. Uh, it also is, is just hard to predict. Like, it can sort of show up at any moment. Uh, my number six is, is it Staticaster? Um, so is it six Try saying that three times fast. Is it yeah. Staticaster? Is it... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's one, a blue, and a red. It's a zero three, so no power. Creature, human, wizard with flash uh, and haste. And when you can tap it, is it static caster deals one damage to target creature and each other creature with the same name as that creature? Um, so, for example, let's say you're playing a lingering souls deck. This thing just flash in and whoop. Um, and I didn't know this, but the, the, the name of the creature, the target can change. I thought once it entered the battlefield, it was locked in. Oh no. So, for example, I had somebody flash in and was like bullard gassed, and then they did their thing, and I was like, damn it. And then, like, the next turn came around and they were like, Narc Amoeba. And I was like, why are you changing on me? And so I didn't know that it could do that. <laughs> um, but if you're doing, and especially in the older formats, you know, it's not uncommon to see lots of little things like Affinity, uh, maybe even like Infect or something like that. Card is hella pesky um, and just really, really useful. And I, I never would have dreamed I would see it in, in older formats the way that we do. It's a little weird, but I can tell you, like, and I went back to, to check, um, Return to Ravnica came right after Innistrad. Talk about, like, you know, home run into another home run. Yeah. Uh, but this card did one thing very well. It shut down Lingering Souls. Lingering Correct. Souls dies to this card. No <laughs> one wants to see this card. It was, to me, if it wasn't engineered to be the hate card that stopped Lingering Souls, it has to be close because it's, it's one worded in, it, yeah, in a very specific way. Yeah, yeah, there are very few cards that can trade on that can come out ahead on a one for one basis ahead of Lingering Souls. And is it Static Caster is one of them? Uh, it's starting to see sideboard play in the humans deck in modern. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, saw a ton of play in standard. Having three toughness is super relevant. Um, in fact, even being able to have zero power, but still being able to attack a la Spellskite. Uh, if you start putting <laughs> plus one plus one counters on yours, it's Static Caster with Thalia's Lieutenant and the, and the like um, can be relevant. Uh, we saw uh, just that Lingering Souls versus is it static caster battle go down in the top eight of the most recent pro tour um in game two uh, against jerry thompson's army of young pyromancer and lingering souls tokens. good ones yeah uh, oh that that all sort of uh got pinged to death over the course of a couple of turns and that that certainly uh helped also against things like squadron hawk um, I remember there were lots of EDH decks that used this with Dovescape um, to be able to, oh, look, your spell is doves now, and now all the doves are dead. Um, <laughs> is it Static Caster is a great card, really good, really well designed, super interesting, and definitely deserving of a top 10. It was super close for my list. I, I kind of went Same. goofy. 
you know, I went Same. a little goof yeah. on there on the end because <laughs> I like my goofy silliness, but Absolutely. it's great. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move on here to number five, of which I don't have one up top. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, do you have a number five? I do. Thankfully, we, you can pass the uh, higher on someone else's list baton to me. And we're going to go way back everybody let's go let's get let's get the wavy uh the fade the star wars we're fade. Going black and white you know. and we're going to take it back to 1997 mirage ladies and gentlemen oh. the finals of the 1997 world championships won by one jacob slemmer of course using the prismatic black aggro deck but second place was janozic Kohn and his jeskai or what they called red white blue speed control and the main win conditions of that speed control deck backed up by counter spells and things like abiance and source to plowshares uh you know this was the hammer of bogerton control deck the win conditions were Wildfire Emissary, which did get reprinted, time-shifted-wise, has protection from white, decent card, but that's not the Izzet card. The Izzet card is Frenetic Ifrit. Yes. Frenetic Ifrit, for y'all who don't know, is a 2-1 <laughs> for a cult, I'm sorry, it's a 2-1 for a colorless, a red, and a blue Ifrit creature from Mirage. It's a rare for Mirage, and it has the following ability. Pay zero mana, colon. Flip a coin. If you win the flip, Frenetic Ifrit phases out. If you lose the flip, sacrifice phasing. Frenetic Ifrit. The current phrasing on phasing, by the way. Are we still phasing phrasing? Uh, while wow. it's phased out, while it's phased out, it's treated as though it doesn't exist. It phases in before you untap. During your next untap step. Um, phasing's a weird ability that most recently saw play in, or saw print in Teferi's response, and previous to that hadn't seen the light of day in 15 years. For Come good on, reason. Dominaria. Because it's complicated as... <laughs> There's oh, yeah. no way they're bringing that back in Dominaria. No, Go ahead. I, no way. Mm. Come anyway, on. for Anyway, for 20 bucks? This is a good way to do it. <laughs> there you go. Get yourself a pie in the face. All right. So... How do you think I got on this show? <laughs> Frenetic of Free is a, is a two-power... Three casting cost flyer um, that when people try to kill it, either with targeted removal or with uh, non-targeted removal, such as Wrath of God, it stayed alive about half the time. Actually, exactly half the time, depending on what kind of coin you're using. Right. Um, the slipperiness of the creature is what made it so potent. It was able to be a control finisher in a deck that had lots of control elements, because it was usually able to get in a couple points of damage before even having to face down any sort of removal. And it was usually what we call a one and a half for one. Either it uh, traded with removal immediately, or it got one of your opponent's removal spells and then came back to fight for more. Frenetic of Free uh, being able to ha have that sort of uh, blinking spirit esque dodge you you know tuck and you know tuck and roll kind of maneuver made it super potent and super powerful uh, and it's in a world champ one I think this is the second world championship decks maybe it's the first um, alongside such powerhouses as thawing glaciers sorts of plowshares force of will as I mentioned earlier um, so you can get your gold bordered Frenetic of Freets if you want to in the future yeah I um, this was my number seven uh, Frenetic of Freet a nice solid place in my heart as I just started playing a lot of competitive magic back then. And a really clear example of at the time of I having no clue of how good this card was like yeah. actual people were showing there was like, Evan, half the time it never dies. And I'm like, but the other half, it's totally dead. Blah, blah, blah. Right. It's a three man, two one. Blah, blah. It's going to die and anyway just, though. Yeah, so. Oh yeah. Trust me. I was just a straight idiot on it. And I could, I could sure. just couldn't wrap my head around. It. I just didn't understand. What are you talking about? Like there's so many, much, so much better threats. It's just a two one. And then it, I saw it in tournament play. And right. then I saw them playing it at the shop. I saw the guy who was playing it, win the tournament. And I was like, wow, they tried to kill that thing three times and it didn't die. And then he played another one and both of them together. You're almost guaranteed one of them is going to make it. It's, it, it was ridiculous. And you know, it was nice eye-opening event for me and it also inspired frenetic sliver in planner chaos uh, which has the same ability and grants your whole sliver team the same ability i just missed that creature type you know one of the reasons i was so happy with kanza tarkir was they brought Jin back they brought ifrit's back you know i remember i remember there was a good stretch of sets where that was a thing where you were regularly seeing Jin and ifrit's and things like that and bring back yes more of that please like that was the visions time 
All yeah. of that. Yes. More more bottles of Suleiman. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh no, bottle's good. City in a bottle is what I don't want to see. City in a bottle yeah. is the one you don't want to see. No. no, but Suleiman's the flipping one, right? Five damage. Right. Yeah, that I'm fine with. Yeah, all those all those gin and Efreedy cards. Oh, the Efreediest. Uh, so, <laughs> Aaron, do you have a number five? It's higher on someone else's list. I think it's my last higher, though. Is it your last? No, nope, I got one more. One oh more. my goodness, so many hires! Oh. But that just means we're just barreling on to number four. My number four uh, is a super fun card that I like a whole heck of a lot. Um, the small sets were bad. Just like it, just in general, like it took a while to really figure out. Hey, man, small sets are bad. Um, and so uh, once they made Born of the Gods, which was like super, super bad, um, they then made Journey in the Nix, which wasn't that bad. They they saved some goodness for the last set, which was cool. Yeah. Uh, and you had the you had the gods going on. Gods super important. They had to fulfill the rest of the god cycle. That was really sweet. And everyone wanted to know what the is it god was because man, that thing's got to be super sweet. And by God, it was sweet. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Because Karanos, God of Storms, is real and is super cool. And I actually got to see some play, which yeah. is kind of rare for the gods, honestly. Like, there were a lot of them, like, Athreos was like, whew, huge, you know, huge spike in, in hype and then died. But right. Karanos, I actually feel like over time has gotten more sort of popular and or at least more respected as a card. Karanos, God of Storms, is a mythic rare from Journey in the Nix. It is a red, blue, and three generic mana for a 6-5 indestructible legendary enchantment creature god. That's a lot of words. But as long as your devotion to blue and red is less than seven, it's not a creature. Okay. You reveal the first card you draw on each of your turns. Whenever you reveal a land card, you draw a card. Whenever you reveal a non-land, Karado steals three damage to target creature or player. So you're getting a bolt or you're getting a free card. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty amazing for five mana. So they, I think they really turned this one up a little bit because they really wanted to see what a very strong sort of control finisher of strong, you know, as the, the game goes on, Karanos gets stronger. And Karanos is really sweet for the set. It made Journey in the Nix not Born of the Gods, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Born of the Gods rather, and, uh, and you know, something really to collect and, and want. This was my number four. Five, okay. um, and this is a card that has even seen older form play in older formats. Modern loves them some Karanos. Yeah. Uh, Miracles, the Miracles decks that splash red also will drop Karanos. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what makes Karanos so strong is that you don't even have to turn it on. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, the uh, there the problem with a lot of the gods from those blocks was that they the effect by itself wasn't very good, and so why would you sit through it to wait for it to get the devotion? The nice thing about Thassa is Thassa did a lot of work for you, whether or not she was on or off. Right. Um, to where you didn't even necessarily care if you had the devotion. I don't think I've ever really seen Karanos have the seven pips, but yeah. just like you said, sort of having it sit there and having it be something that's very difficult to deal with, an indestructible enchantment, um, and just having it do what you want it to do normally, just sort of pinging things, drawing cards. Um, fun fact, you can also get around Containment Priest by reanimating this, um, because it doesn't count as a creature on the trip from the graveyards. Yeah. Oh, that's so brutal. <laughs> so if you're really that's miserable. About, yeah, so if you're, if you're really worried about Containment Priest, you can use this as a reanimation target and it counts as an enchantment wow. while it's in the graveyard. Yeah, it's everything. <laughs> but yeah, I love it. I love the fact that it can just sort of sit there and do what it needs to do and, and give you time to catch up. And yeah, definitely a sleeper by far. And beautiful art too. Right. I always thought it was weird that Karanos, like whenever you turned on Karanos, it was incidental. Like you did yeah. it by accident. Yeah, like, oh, you, did it, be, you, you did it like as you were having infinite pester mites coming into play <laughs> off of your Kiki Jiki. Like it was, yeah. oh, by the way, this is also a creature now. It was like the flip <laughs> of Iroas, god of victory, the red white god, which was totally useless unless it was a creature, at which point it became absurd. This is the opposite. This is like, doesn't ever need to be a creature. And when it's a creature, it's actually kind of worse because now you open yourself up to Path's Exile and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was a, a, a favorite sideboard choice for control style mirrors. Um, Sean McLaren, I believe, won a Pro Tour with a copy of this in his sideboard. He got second place at another Pro Tour, I believe, with the same uh, Karanos. Um, he's been a big fan of this card forever. Um, the champ is here, etc. Um, <laughs> it's a little weird that the God of Storms has nothing to do with Storm. Um, he's got but, a lightning uh, bolt in his he hand. Does, he, makes, he makes a lightning bolt, that's for sure. He does do that. Um, but I meant Storm the Mechanic. I understand, but he makes a bolt. Sure. He's, he's, he's quite, it. he's, look, he's a powerful card. He is, and he it also harkens back to the card Lightning Bolt, which is, which is very nice. <laughs> Karanos God of Storm is a very good card. Uh, well-deserving. Super sweet. Ruben, what's your number four? 
So my number five took us way, way, way back. We're going to come back to the present with another creature that also costs a colorless, a blue, and a red that is also seeing top tournament table play. Uh, this is perhaps the best, or maybe not the best, but certainly the, the, the most powerful creature currently in the best deck in standard. Um, my uh, number four is Whirler Virtuoso. Yeah. Colorless blue red for a Veldalkin Artificer. It is a 2 3 <laughs> uncommon from Kaladesh. When Whirler Virtuoso enters the battlefield, you get three energy counters. And if you pay three energy, you create a 1 1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. So the energy decks, of course, are extremely powerful. They've won multiple Pro Tours at this point. Um, and Whirler Virtuoso is one of the cards that holds the whole deck together. The most powerful thing about energy is that there's lots of cards that make it, and then there's lots of cards that use energy, and you can siphon that energy in whichever direction the current board state requires. A lot of the time, you'll be left over with a lot of extra energy after casting Harness Lightnings that target Glint sle Sleeve Siphoners, or um, uh, you make a Bristling Hydra, and then they don't kill your guy. So then you just have double-digit energy in your pool, and then you drop a Whirler Virtuoso to be able to have the equivalent of a mana sink. This is an energy sink to be able to make an army of flyers. Whirler Virtuoso itself, even with no extra energy, provides you with three power and four toughness across two bodies, one of which has flying, which is already well above the curve, and can sometimes create for you three, four, maybe even five flying creatures that provide you with a very fast clock. Whirler mm. Virtuoso is an extremely powerful card. It was even numbers for me whether this or Rogue Refiner got banned in the most recent, uh, second most recent uh, standard banned uh, update. Um, and Whirler Virtuoso will see play reliably in top eights for the remainder of its time in standard. It's, it's, energy is broken. Like, it's <laughs> weird. It took us a while. It took everyone, you know, it's like, oh, it was Etherworks Marvel was the problem. That's not the problem. No, it was not Etherworks Marvel. It was right. energy itself. This card turns into a 2-3 with a 1-1 one, one, to a 2-3 with an army. Just mm -hmm. for free. Just no more yep. extra. Nothing nothing bonus that much right. about it. You're just like, oh, because I drew it late, now we get to have a ton of flyers. That's right. That's absurd. That's a crazy rate. Or it's a 2-3 that allows your Confiscation Coups to steal Scarab Gods. Or it's a 2-3 that allows your Harnessed Lightnings to kill 6-6s. Six it does so Ooh. much for so little of a cost. I mean, three yeah. mana for a two, three is already good enough. And then you get this extra resource. Um, yeah, it's kind of absurd. I mean, you you would probably expect a multicolor two, three, you know, for, for three mana, you got to have a little something on there. Oh, but, sure. But of course. the way that energy doesn't scale sort of correctly and, and weirdly, it's just, man, energy was such a neat idea. But And you God. also don't really care if it dies. You know, yeah. there's no, you know, one of the complaints about energy was that you're getting value regardless where, you know, if, if, if somebody can kills your Thalia, she dies. I mean, she's doing things while she's out, but you don't really get anything for your trouble. If you play a Whirler Virtuoso, you, Virtuoso, you're getting energy when it comes into play, and if somebody decides to kill it, you can spend it and still get Thopters for your trouble. Even if you haven't gained any additional energy, you can do something with the energy it alone gave you, and that's wild. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just a silly busted mechanic and yeah you couldn't get rid of it you know from your opponent yeah. which was insane and uh, we'll we'll put energy in a weird spot in history it's gonna yes it's gonna go into a strange little corner of oddities come hang out with <laughs> us well you can come hang out with the dredge kids it's cool <laughs> there you go <laughs> the dredge the storm the affinity for artifacts and we'll have and our little table kids. at the gathering just... I don't know where energy goes on the storm scale but I'm I can imagine it's pretty high up there we're gonna be like if if, if magic mechanics were like a school cafeteria we would be like the mean girls like it's storm dredge like oh my god look at them over there just with their phasing and their you know they're they're exalted all the cool pretty mechanics you know like march outside smoking <laughs> some cigarettes behind the dumpster it's like pretty much them. yeah do we won't <laughs> aaron what's your number four speaking of broken things Ooh. uh my number four is a common a common like again you look at this and you're like huh that brought new life to an archetype that had kind of fallen on hard times a little bit um and it is now a a four of uh, it is a format defining card um we've seen a lot of this card recently um very is it. it it just kind of drips with flavor um in fact so it was this card and another card that were enablers of a popular archetype and the older card has now fallen out of favor in in favor of Baral, 
chief mm-hmm. of compliance. So Baral has bumped uh, Pyromancer's ascension out the damn door. And now it's up to Baral and this little character to keep Storm afloat. I'm a number four is Goblin Electromancer. Um, who would have thought? Um, it's a red and a blue, again, a common, a 2-2 Goblin Wizard from Return to Ravnica. Instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one colorless less to cast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you get this out on turn two, there's a pretty good chance you can go off on turn three. If you've got a good enough hand, you can totally do it. Um, I've picked up Blue Red Storm a little bit, and and this card really does make it. So it was Pyromancer's Ascension in this card that you wanted to sort of be your your going off point. Um, and now that Baral is out, Pyromancer's Ascension is out the door, and it's up to these these two. Um, and at very worst, it can be a beater. You know, sometimes people do come prepared to hate Storm, and sometimes you can just get in there with your tutu. And um, the card is dumb, um, especially if you're playing a lot of instant and sorceries like Storm is wont to do. Um, but this card really did bring new life to Storm because Seething Song had gotten banned and some other things. And 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 some people argue Storm is still too powerful, but you can rest assured if there's going to be Storm in Modern, you have this card to thank for it. God, they have reprinted the hell out of this card already. Yeah. It has five different printings. God bless it. it. And it was also <laughs> in Dual Decks Mind vs. Might where they put Storm in Walmart. Let's never forget, right. I will never let them live that down. <laughs> They Hashtag put, Storm and Walmart. We need to save that for the Magic Mike Seas. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Hashtag Storm and Walmart, y'all. Come on. But uh, Electromancer right. by itself, because it's sweet, because ultimately it is just a common. It's just a two-mana two-two bear. If you don't have a lot of instant sorceries, it doesn't do a lot. It's just a bear. But if you're able to take advantage of it, go nuts. And because that's... That savings yeah. adds up. Like, How oof. is it is that, yeah. right? You know, if you care about <laughs> yeah. it, you're going to go crazy. And if you don't, who cares? Just a there, I, I remember when uh, all of uh, the Pantheon was playing Storm uh, at, at the uh, at the modern, at one of the modern Pro Tours mm-hmm. or one of the modern GPs. And John Finkel was on camera and it was game two or game three and he just didn't cast any spells and he just beat his opponent to death with three Goblin Electromancers. It was so great because they excited out all the removal and he was just like, all right, here's a bear, here's a bear, here's a bear, kill you. <laughs> But you have to fear the ability first before you fear the body, because that ability is crazy. Baral is great, don't get me wrong, but Baral's a legend, so you only get one in play at a time. And Baral also don't got two power, so it's a lot tougher to beat down with Baral's. Goblin Electromancer, super good at what it does, uh, extra efficient, uh, gave that obviously is, is best known now for the that or even the popper decks that allow for... Um, Storm before the banning of uh, Empty the Wardens in Popper um, or Grape Shot in Popper also. Um, you'd allow it for one mana Manamorphos or Desperate Rituals or Pyretic Rituals or Grape Shots or Seeding Songs or what have you. Um, yeah, Goblin Electromancer is just an extremely potent card. So, I mean, it also allowed you to tater um, there for a second. <laughs> it, it was adorable. We, we, we love your taters. That didn't sound right. But maybe if to play the Storm deck, you have to have big barals. Is that what you're telling me? Okay. Just check. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but again, but again, they're legendary, so you only get to have one barrel. I've time. got that song in my head. I've got big brawls. <laughs> She's got big brawls. <laughs> well, we have the biggest brawls of them all, okay? With number uh, three. Do number three here. Aaron, what's your number three? It's my last hire Ooh. on my list. Last one. Yeah, that is unfortunate. So, Ruben, do you have a number three? No, this is actually my last hire as well. Well, somebody's got to save the number. Somebody's <laughs> got to be here so we can actually have a number three because we didn't even have a number seven. We didn't have one. Let me tell you, when I first built the cube, um, as the cube is known today, one of the things, until the day that, that my cube left me for, for greener pastures, this card was in it. This card was in the only five. I only had five Is It cards in, and that eventually that expanded. But when it first started, yeah, only five. This thing was there from day numero uno. This card is sweet. It's always been sweet. It's super cool to take advantage of, and its gameplay is absolutely terrific. And I'm talking about a guild pack card. I'm talking about Gelectrode. Gelectrode is such a wonderful design. It's such I love a, the art. It's so cool and weird and strange. And it's a red and blue and generic mana for an 01 
weird. Yeah, we're starting off yeah. good. It's weird and it looks weird. Uh, but it has two different things on it. One, it's tap colon. It deals one damage to target creature or player. And the second is whenever you play an instant or sorcery spell, you may untap electrode. So sometimes it's just ping you, play a whatever, ping you again. Sometimes it's ping you, play a whatever, and kill your tutu. Like, you know, it just, it kind of it, it deals the last few points of damage if you need to or the last point of damage. It kills people out of nowhere. Like, ping you, bolt, ping you. That's five damage right there. So electrode has always been sweet and good and awesome and I loved it and I could just I could just never take it out of the cube every time it was another blue red spell you're like yeah but Electrode's insane do you know what this art reminds me of okay go with me on this we're gonna have to go back in the day I remember when I was a kid and and they made this kid's toothpaste and it was like blue and starry yeah. Yeah. and it tasted nothing like real toothpaste it was like this this fruity flavor yeah. and it was amazing and every time I look at Electrode I just imagine that really good kid's toothpaste and I just toothpaste imagine monster. it's just this little toothpaste monster coming out like you didn't brush behind your gums and just it's great and <laughs> so funny story about that toothpaste um <gasps> Once upon a time, I went to 4-H camp, and 4-H camp was cool, and you're in this like sort of cabin with all these other with all these other boys or whatever. But when we got there, for whatever reason, it was like too late, I think, for supper or whatever, for dinner. So we didn't really have dinner, so we were all like starving, and we're like, what should we eat? And somebody <gasps> said, well, I've got this toothpaste that looks oh, good, no. and it tastes great. And I swear to God, <laughs> we're sitting there like 10-year-old, 11-year-old boys passing the toothpaste around and eating eating the toothpaste and Ooh. then oh yeah and then cue like sometime later i think like maybe a half hour all of us just going like oh my god everyone's we're so vomiting. sick and everyone's everyone, running off to the bathroom everyone becoming the toothpaste monster oh my god <laughs> and so Gosh. i never used that toothpaste ever again man that's my toothpaste. that's my starry toothpaste story Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we're going to move on here to number two. We got to give them something. There's a lot of hires. Uh, wow. Where I share a number two. I also share a number two. Screw you guys. <laughs> we're on that. We're on that cycle. We're on that wavelength, man. We got you. Why don't you go yeah. ahead and tell the tell the peeps what's going on with this number two? I mean, it's this is the card that is the definition of value, right? Like this is. The card, this might be the card that defines is it entirely, mm -hmm. actually. It is a instant speed trick um, that gives you lots of choices. It deals damage. It draws a card. Um, you know, there, there are many like it. There are lots of things like Prophetic Bolt and things like uh, Winter Flame, um, other blue-red burn spells that do things like it. But nothing really lives up to Electrolyze. Mm -hmm. It's just, it just is, it is, it just is, is it? Wow. Um, yeah, colorless blue red originally from Guild Pact. It's an uncommon that has been reprinted several times, including most recently in Iconic Masters, because it is very iconic. It's an instant. Electrolyze deals two damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or players. Draw a card. Man, this card is good. I mean, this this is like the glue that holds a lot of those blue red decks together in in modern and in standard when it was legal and standard. Um, it it just does so much for you in cube. Uh, it, it replaces itself quickly. Um, you know, it it usually is able to be uh, at least a two for one, sometimes even a three for one, knocking off something like an uh, two mana elves and drawing you a card. Uh, Electrolyze is just extremely potent, extremely powerful, and I think that. It, it, is is could could well be argued could be the number one is it card? It was my almost my number one. Obviously, we're number two here. We're we're, we're on the same wavelength. It was my number three. Oh wow! Well, see, there you go. Here we go. <laughs> That's what Legendary says. This thing. Well, first of all, they printed the hell out of this card. Also, they made this thing a comic book promo. You remember the wow, IDW really? comics from 2012? There is a unique Dak Faden's doing something on a card. That's IDW awesome. Pro, which is insane. It, they made it the extended art promo for, for champs and states that one year. Uh, it's in Commander 11, Modern Masters, Modern Masters 2015, the Iconic Masters. They, they printed and printed and printed this card because it just helps define what you want blue and red to be doing. It's yep. value. It's not too much value. Like if it had been three damage, it had been too much. Oh, been, of course. Been one damage, it been unplayable. But two damage, split how you want, man. It's just, it's just, it's just a chef's kiss. It's just, oh, it's just perfect. I love yeah, that. it's exactly the right mana cost for exactly the right effect. Yeah, that's awesome. So move on here to number two for Aaron. Aaron, what you got? Some cards 
are made good. They, they are forced, they are pushed, wizards knows they are good, they want you to use them, that's the whole point. And then there are cards that are accidentally good, where they just kind of show up, and maybe they show up at a time where they just show up in, in weird points in the game, or maybe wizards didn't really think about the cards that were going to come before or after them, and then accidents happen. And this card is the epitome of a card that's accidentally good. When you look at it, it's cute. Like, it's okay. <laughs> um, but this card ended up being whoopsie good in at least two formats, going on three, depending on your perspective. Uh, my number two is Sahili Rai. <laughs> Uh, now, so when she first came out, I used to call her Sahili Y, because why would you play her? She's terrible. <laughs> um, but we'll get there in a second. So Sahili's one, a blue and a red. She's a planeswalker who starts off with three loyalty. Uh, you can plus one and scry one. Sahili Rai deals one damage to each opponent. Okay. Um, minus two. Here's where it gets good. Uh, create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. That token gains haste, exile it at the beginning of the next end step. Then the card called Felidar Sovereign Felidar came out, Guardian. Guardian. Well, our guardian came out and people started to put two and two together and realized you could do almost a splinter twin kind of combo in standard and yep. wizards actually went on the record as going we didn't think of that <laughs> we just what? missed it like because that was and this was it was an incredible time because it was found when the full spoiler was posted yes. the full spoiler for Calda showed up and then someone went huh and uh huh and then <laughs> the internet exploded like yep. in like five minutes, you couldn't find a Sahili Rai within like seven time zones yourself because so then it was. cut to vintage. Oh my God. Uh, and there was an archetype that sprang up called Sahili Oath. So people started playing her in Oath of Druids decks yep. where you would do sort of the same thing, but with Sun Titan. <laughs> wow. And you haven't lived until you've made like six Sun Titans. <laughs> God. Um, oh, and she has a last ability. Um, so minus oh, seven, search your library for up to three artifact cards with different names, put them on the battlefield, and shop your library. That's cute, but like... <laughs> no one cares. So we had standard, we had vintage, and God bless her, there are people that are trying to make her happen in modern, because Splinter Twin is not a thing anymore, officially. Sure. Um, but there are some people that are doing the Felidar thing, they're doing the Sahili thing. My friend Autumn Burkett, five and out a couple leagues with her, and just, just accidentally good. Like, this is a card that by itself, nobody would have cared about. But, you know, when you pair her together with things like Oath of Druids, Sun Titan, uh, Felidar Guardian, broken things happen, and God bless her. <laughs> this is a card ripe for broken things to happen. Yes. This is this is a card that it's either it feels like it's either busted or it's terrible. There's you know there's it's the either works Marvel you know it's either busted or it's unplayable garbage. And this was kind of laughed at when it first came out. No one really you know like they spoiled it, and you're like oh cool that's a planeswalker that's cool I like planeswalkers that's fine. And then the full spoiler showed up, and like I remember like tell, uh, telling the guys the cool stuff guys at a Grand Prix like typing hey. Uh, this exists, and you now need to know about it. And it just like well, we actually went to whole set. Felidar Guardian didn't come out until either revolt, so she was terrible oh, right. for a full for a full yeah. set. Oh, and okay. then the either revolt set, set review. I remember I was on the road. I remember I was traveling to an event, and I remember I was looking up the set on my phone. And I remember I had the oh, tab yeah. open with the image gallery on a Friday because they did the whole like it's open. And I remember doing that, and all of a sudden my Twitter starts blowing up, and I'm like, what could be going on here? Is it just hype over the set? Oh no! And then Twitter was like, Sahili's good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I recall this now. This, this was my this actually come out and say we didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, this was my number six, by the way. Definitely deserving. Um, you know, I think that uh, Blue Red has some of the best pedigree of of planeswalkers. Although Sahili by itself isn't very good at anything in particular. It doesn't protect <laughs> herself. Um, like, you know, like most points, most planeswalkers, what you want to do is have a card advantage engine and a way to protect yourself. And this one actually does neither by itself, really. It doesn't, it goes up to four on your third turn, which is okay. It's not a card advantage engine. It does scry. So there's some card selection. It's able to ping opposing planeswalkers, which can keep them under wraps, I guess. But like, yeah, exactly. So, you know. It's fine. And, and I, it's weird because, well, first of all, Aether Revolt and Kaladesh have very similar set logos, which is what I was looking at. Um, but yeah, to have a whole set, you know, kind of period of just like, <laughs> meh, 
it's crap. Who wants this thing? Yeah. You know, get your copies for four <laughs> bucks or whatever because you want it for Commander. And then it was like, and to twenty five dollars it goes. Right. Oh, well, that, immediately. This, I mean, it, it was there was the Helioth pretty much immediately. People figured mm. out that it could combo off with with Sun Titan. Basically, if you get if you have the Oath and you Oath into your Sun Titan and flip over two copies of Saheli, yep. you can make infinite Sun Titans by yeah. Legend ruling itself mm-hmm. over and over and over again, um, and then attack with them all that turn. So that's pretty cool. Mm. Um, and so the vintage players. We're already on board the Sahili train by the time the rest of us constructed hooligans had found uh, our our white creature that combos well with it. Fair enough. All right, so we're going to move on here to number one, which you guys... Ruben! On the cycle, we share, yeah. Oh, my Look, God. Uh, it, it, this Honestly, I had two cards that could possibly have been number one for me. Uh, Electrolyze, we talked about, is my number two. Um, but for me, there really couldn't be... A number one. There couldn't be a greatest is it card that wasn't the greatest thief in the multiverse. That's Dak Faden. Yeah. Mm. So God bless Dak Faden. Yeah. So <laughs> Dak Faden is a colorless, a red and a blue for a planeswalker creature. Dak, uh, originally a mythic from the original Conspiracy. Three loyalty and has three abilities. Plus one, target player draws two cards, then discards two cards. Minus two, gain control of target artifact. And minus six, you gain you get an emblem with, whenever you cast a spell that targets one or more permanents, gain control of those permanents. Um, the minus two ability on this card cannot be understated. This might be the most powerful minus second ability on any Planeswalker. It, has, it is a complete and utter blowout every time you're able to minus two. It makes it a first pick in the Vintage Cube because you can steal all of the power, all of the mana vaults, not to mention things like Mind Slaver or Sundering Titan from your opponents, and you just get to keep them permanently forever. The plus one Faithless Looting effect is very useful as well. It allows you to uh, filter out some extra lands or perhaps dig into extras if you need to. Also um, facilitates reanimation strategies, gives you extra value out of your flashback spells to be able to draw more cards. Delve, of course. Yep, absolutely an excellent delve engine. And then that minus six, don't count that out because there are lots of things that are able to target permanence, things like the Blasts um of, of various types pingers now become tap gain control of target creature um yeah the dac dac faden is just an unbelievably potent and powerful card and let's not forget the most broken aspect uh so there's a deck in vintage that pops up from time to time called grixis thieves and right. the dream is to play notion thief <laughs> And then you target, I think, the opponent, and then so like you, target you the opponent. right? So you, you draw, draw the, the cards, cards, and they have to discard. And there's right. a bit of a lock there, and it's dumb. <laughs> I have a very, I have a good story about that. There was a vintage tournament that took place in Pennsylvania. This is legend in the Eastern Pennsylvania area now, um, where a player was playing vintage for one of the first times, and his opponent went Dak Faden into Notion Thief and targeted his opponent. And his opponent read both cards, and he went, "Damn, that's some powerful magic." <laughs> And now, anytime there's like a cool combo or an interesting interaction that pops up, hashtag powerful magic is the <laughs> is the go-to. Um, yeah, Dak Faden, by the way, that's some powerful magic. This is as essential as Chase the Mind Sculptor. If, if you're playing red and blue in, in Vintage, you are playing Dak Faden. It, it is that important of a card. Strangely enough, it doesn't see a lot of legacy play, which oh, which is kind of fascinating. I'll be playing at least one copy in my Painter Grindstone list. Coach. Bless your yeah. heart. <laughs> oh, the heart is so Or Narnars in that deck. <laughs> I, I, but in Vintage, it's a mainstay. And yeah, I mean, it says it says something about a card when you rock it all the way to the top. When, when no other format really notices you but vintage does that really says something to this because that's a very high bar to clear and to be an essential card like this is a card the blue decks do not leave home without um it, it just speaks to its its power its its power level oh yeah it's it's a good one and i also love that in the artwork he, he literally has a red hand i didn't know this at the time but apparently dak has been around for a while like i remember when the card came out i didn't know who he was and i was expecting there to be some sort of new story to sort of tell new players like me but the season vorthoses were like oh no girl he's been a thing for a while and i'm like really like i guess they were comic books or they were graphic novels or something right um, but a comic been, book promo. Well, yeah he's been the doing the thing for a while like he had run-ins with Ash on high tide yeah uh, like i didn't know that novel. Yeah, so he's he's pretty seasoned. And Vanessa Martin's cosplay of Dak Faden is one of I mean she does amazing cosplay all the time, but this this one in particular was super impressive. Mm-hmm. So I can my number one look. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna shake the cane 
of old man magic at you guys, okay? <laughs> because and Tell I'm the also sorry, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm having up right magic, you know. <laughs> we get him out of the tater sacks and just see what was in there. Um, <laughs> we, look, first of all, I'm a little pissed off that when they reprinted it last in Commander 2017, no less, they decided to not include the flavor text of what is one of the mo- greatest flavor texts of all time. Most iconic, yeah. certainly, yeah. Yes, Guild Pact. Guild Pact defined is it. There was no is it until Guild Pact. There was no is it until Niv Mizzet. The Firemind shows up. Ooh. The original. The OG. The guy who's going to be sparring with uh, Nicol Bolas whenever they show back up to Ravnica, return to return to Ravnica, here probably either later this year or next year. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. Uh, but he, he was the original, and he was fantastic. And it has it's for two red, two blue, two generic mana for a 4-4 legendary dragon wizard. A rare from Guild Pack that has flying. Whenever you draw a card, Niv Mizzet the Fire Mine deals one damage to target creature or player, and it has tap colon draw a card. It also has one of the most famous uh, or, or infamous uh, flavor texts that looks like a weird math problem, but when you turn it sideways like you're drawing cards, it says Niv Mizzet equals number one, which yes. it does. Which it, it is number one. It's what it's what it equaled right there. Absolutely, it's number three on my list. Mm. Um, but yeah, it certainly is well deserving of a top spot. I mean, this was another one that it is you know easily in the conversation. You're right; it defines is it. Um, you know, this is the guild leader of the is it. The flavor behind Niv Mizzet is hilarious to me because Niv Mizzet is so smart that he himself is aware that he is a char- character in a card game. He is. He knows that. That is how smart the character is. Is wow. that he is beyond the fourth wall. He's also uh, been described as being one of the characters that could possibly go toe to toe with Bolas. Like they're yeah. being just in terms of intellect alone. Like you know, there's they're, they're dropping a lot of hints that we're probably going to go back to Ravnica. And I really feel like if anybody, maybe not physical equal, but mentally, oh, Niv can take oh, him on, sure. and I'm living for that. It's, it's going to be epic. And Niv Mizzet, Niv Mizzet rather, is very very epic. He's and responsible. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say there was a standard deck that uh, with this and Ophidian Eye, where you mm. could go infinite, not infinite, but however many cards in your deck could deal that much damage to an opposing pl- uh, creature or player or any combination thereof. Um, and so there was a, there were a couple of like, is it Tron decks where that was the main goal was to try to get an Ophidian Eye onto an Admizit and deal your opponent 40 damage or whatever. Yeah, he's responsible for one of my favorite flavor texts of all time on Enter the Infinite. He says, don't just have an idea, have all of them. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I just love that. It's like, it's oh. such a great character. <laughs> it's also yep. a great, great character. It's not like it's a cool card and it helps define a guild or whatever. No, no, like it, it is the guild. He's yeah. Named after himself, for God's sake. <laughs> also inspired the next Niv Mizzet, Niv Mizzet Draco Genius, which I believe is more popular as a, a general for a commander than the original. Um, but it, it sort of is a twist on the same kind of ability, whereas when you would draw a card, you deal a damage. This one is when you deal a damage, you draw a card, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, Niv Mizzet, the Firemind, the, the OG, the original guild leader of the Izzet. The OGL, if you will. OGL. There you go. So that was our top 10 Izzet cards. You'll see them on the screen right now for you to take a look at. I want you to take a look at my list, Aaron's list, and Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before I go, I want to thank my co-hosts. Thank you, Aaron. Is it time to say goodbye? It's time I don't... to say goodbye. <laughs> it's so done, hard to say goodbye <laughs> yesterday. Is it? Is it, though? Jeez. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. You guys are great. Moving to our final slide here. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, my co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-host, Aaron Campbell, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash MagicMikes. Visit our website at MagicMikesPodcast. <laughs> I ain't doing this. Visit our website at MagicMikesPodcast.com that exists thanks to our Patreon supporters. Or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe. Do everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash MagicMikes, on Twitter at MagicMikesCast, and on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash MagicMikes. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash magic mics talk to us privately at magic mics podcast at gmail.com follow the audio only podcast at magic mic magic mics podcast.libsen.com or find us on itunes or join us here next week for another top 10 episode of magic mics good night everybody